Welcome back to Razmafstar TV. Today I am having Miles Wining here back on our channel. And how are you, Miles, today? I'm good. Thank you so much, sir, for uh, bringing me back on. It's such an honor to be on here. This is such a great conversation and we go into so many rabbit holes. I love it. Thank you very much. I, uh, you have a written a book, which is, could you just yourself introduce your book? What's the title of your book and what is it all about? So the book is called Into Helmand with the Walking Dead. And it was written by myself and a co-author, uh, Kevin Schranz. We both served in the same Marine infantry unit in between the years of 2010 and 2014. And it's about our experiences in the Marine infantry um, during our time there and our time in getting out and especially our time in Afghanistan um, over the two deployments that we had and uh, getting out of the service um, and talking about it in sort of in a nutshell. Okay. What, I mean, what was the motivating factor for you? What was, why did you write this book? Because there's always, you know, when you write a book, there is always something behind it. As an author, I know now, for example, when you want to write something, there is always some urge inside telling you write this book. What was that for you? For me, I was always, uh, I've always been interested in military history. I was always interested in reading. I mean, my, I was always interested in writing and reading and that kind of stuff. So I was always there. Um, but really what really kind of irked me in, in, in my generation of Marines and in serving in the time that we did was I was kind of, um, I was kind of irked by the rest of the market. You know, I was looking at the book market and, you know, seeing, okay, like, well, well, well how does, you know, how, do, how is my generation defined by the stories out there? And it was all the, it's always all these books about special operations and these snipers and officers and these staff NCOs, sergeants major. And for me, I was always, when I was reading my military history books, I was never interested in this, you know, the lofty uh, strategic perspective. I was always interested in that that um that you know you know that on the ground perspective in the muck in the mire kind of thing um i was never you know if i wanted to read about gettysburg like, i didn't really care about what the generals were deciding i wanted to read an account of you know what was it like to be in pickett's charge or what was it like to defend against pickett's charge and so that was my that was how i took it on and um kevin trons um, or my co-author uh he took it on the same way um, we had the same perspective on this matter. And we were both saying, you know, where's our story? Well, where's the story of the, the teenager going to war in this era? Um, and where is that? Where is that in the, in the lineup here? And that's, that's really where it began. And that's, this is kind of my, my um, well, our, our, um, our submittal to, you know, <laughs> to society, as it were, of that. Okay, Miles, before we go into your book, and I'm going to ask you about different parts of the, your book, please tell our viewers about your educational background. That's always something which people always ask. Tell, tell us what you did regarding your educational background, please. Uh, for my educational background, I graduated from, I, I went to school in uh, Thailand and Burma and Malaysia as a child. And I graduated from a military school in Pennsylvania called Valley Forge Military Academy. And then I, when I was in the Marines, I enlisted and then I got out and I went to Indiana University in Bloomington. And my major was Central Eurasian Studies. And I was really fascinated by Pashtu from my deployments in Afghanistan. I really wanted to learn more. And I graduated with a, a degree, a, a a major in Central Eurasian Studies and then what was called an Islamic Studies Certificate, kind of between a minor and a major, and then a Religious Studies minor and a Near Eastern Languages and Cultures minor. These, these are undergraduate minors, right? I mean, they're not, they're not the biggest deal in the world. Um, but that, that, that's sort of my education perspective from an academic standpoint. Um, I graduated in 2016. Yes, and you also have SILA Report. Could you tell us about your organization before we go into your book, please? What is SILA Report? What does it stand for, please? Sure. So SILA um, I was, means weapon, as, as you know, um, from Arabic and Turkish. 
and Farsi and Wusla in uh, Pashto and then also in Urdu. And I was really fascinated by these regions of the world. Um, and I was also really fascinated in small arms and weapons. And this was a convergence of my two interests in my fascination in small arms and then my fascination in the regions. And I just, I just noticed there's a big niche in sort of examining um, a gap in a research gap, if you will, and examining um, the arms from these regions, both historically and, can, can, and contemporarily. Um, there, there was a lack of primary source research. There was a lack of local representation interest. There is a lack from um, the folks into the region. There is a lack from them on the technical aspect of the small arms. And then there is a lack from the small arms researchers on the actual region itself. And I said, you know, this is a really, I think this is really fascinating. Why don't we start something um, that looks into this? And so I started with my friend, um, Haracha Hyrapet in 2016, 17-ish. And we're about four years on now and we have a website and we sell stuff and we write um we write articles and we try to get in touch with folks like you to talk about um firearms in iran and then talking about historical stuff but then also talking about contemporary stuff you know what's happening right now in the region so. okay back to the marines uh, i mean i hope you don't mind this question why did you join marine corps uh, for me, it, for me, I, it's, I, I always tell this to people and I always hear uh, why, and it's very hard for me to answer that question because there never was a why in my mind. If that ever, you know, this wasn't, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't make a logical, um, you know, I didn't sit down at a table one day. I said, okay, what are my <laughs> options here? I got the army, I got the air force, I got the Navy. Should I even go in the military? Should I be an officer? Should I be an enlisted? Should I go to college first? The, this was never on the table. It was, there was never a why for me. There was an instinct of, I want to fight. I want to be in the muck and the mire. I want to be in the front lines. I want to try to prove myself and see if I have what it takes. And I want to go into combat. Um, I want to do all that. And that was, and that was it, you know? Um, and there was, there was no, there was no why reason, you know, eh, there's, you know, as, a, as a, you know, as you're young, you know, there's, there's various feelings of patriotism and there's various feelings of other stuff. But to be honest, the raw, the raw reason was I wanted to be in combat. I wanted to fight. I wanted to, I wanted to get in it. Um, just as I'd been in all as a child, you know? So, I mean, as you possibly know, I also know many uh, people in different military worldwide, of course, I'm sure you're aware of that. And when you went to the military, you know, it's always like that, that people always talk about military. And when they go into military, I think the boot camp or the training, when it starts, <laughs> everyone starts to get a bit pensive if I want to look for a very politically correct word, right? So they start to just say, say, oh God, what am I doing here? Was it your experience when you started to, uh, with your Marine Corps training? Did you start to ask yourself, I mean, tell us about your training and the basic training first and how you felt. To be, so to be honest, because I came from that, that to be honest, because I came from that background of you know, I was just so fascinated by, by the infantry and by the military. And I just, you know, consume these books all the time and watch the war movies and read the books and, you know, talk to young Marines and old Marines. You know, I was just so consumed by it. And, and I went, and the more important thing was I went to uh, Valley Forge, which was, is a military um, academy and military high school in Pennsylvania. And my culture shock in terms of, uh, an introduction, a culture shock to military training um, really came at Valley Forge in you know, the 11th grade when I was about 16 years old. That's really where the culture shock was. So when when I went to boot camp in um, June of 2010, it, to be honest, there really wasn't much of a culture shock. Um, it, there was a sort of there was a sort of like, oh, oh man, they're, they're really yelling at us a lot. And this is a lot more intense than Valley Forge. But I didn't, there was not that culture shock that I think most 
men and, and women go through when they go to Paris Island or San Diego. And they get that that switch happens from, you know, civilian life to the military. And they're just, oh, everything's just, uh, you know, I kind of I kind of been through it at Valley Forge. Right. Um, and then also it's it, I mean, it's, you know, the first couple of days are going to be a shock to anyone, really. But it also is just like anything in life. You kind of adjust to it and then you kind of learn, you know, how to how to how to deal with things and, you know, how to how to how to, how to find the angles and where to take breaks and stuff like that. Um, and I sort of, I don't know, I sort, I sort of reflect this in the book as well, um, with, I sort of skip over boot camp entirely. Um, and it's, that's also indicative of kind of my experience of saying, of that is indicative because boot camp wasn't this transformative culture shock. Boom. You know, I was, I was already, I was already waiting to go through it. Um, and it was when I really got, when I got to the fleet, um, it was the operating forces of the Marine Corps. To me, to me, that was a more transformative experience because that was, I'm finally doing the job that I've wanted to do for so long. Now let's, let's get to work sort of thing. Um, and that, and I, I show it in the book. It's like, you know, the book starts getting into the fleet, you know, boot camp is sort of skipped over kind of thing. So and yeah. what was this transformation, or if I may uh, say so, the, the shock for you when you went there, or the change? For, go for going to boot camp or going into the fleet? Fleet. For going into the fleet, it was, it was, um, because the thing with, the difference between the training environment, both at the, Val both at Valley Forge and at, um, and at boot camp, is you have all these regulations and everything sort of, there's all these checks and balances in place and the instructors, the instructors can only do so much to you. And that's part of it. But when you, when I got to the fleet, part of that transformative thing sort of went away and there were no more checks and balances. Um, you know, the, the seniors and the hazing, I mean, the, the hazing that, the, that the seniors put a lot of boots through in the fleet Marine force um, is, is, completely outside of training there are no there are no there there's that's why it's called hazing is there are no checks and balances right and it's something that I went through with all with all my friends and all the guys I went in with and um you know living in fear of walking out of your barracks room and having these seniors always yelling at you and it was really sort of um what was really the really transformative part was really sort of becoming becoming that young adult of now you have these responsibilities and you see people getting kicked out or getting injured. Um, and I mean, this we're talking about in peace in, in peacetime in the US, you haven't even deployed yet. And you see people making dumb mistakes and they're ruining their lives. And you see guys getting married or, you know, taking drugs or stuff like that. And you see these people ruining their lives at that early stage. That's like, you know, wow, you're an adult now. Um, you know, and it's, you have actual control of your life and you're an individual at that point. I think that was the more, that was a transformative piece because at boot camp, um, you're sort of this robot, um, that you don't really actually have control of your life. You, you're a robot that you get told what to do and you get given these commands and you have to function on them. And you could be a bad robot. Sure. But once you get you know, you become an adult, it's like, now you're not a robot anymore. Now you're an individual and you see people do that. Um, and that, I think that's what I would say that is, and, and with that kind of thing, so. And, uh, may I say that very hard physical training as well, right? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, the field ops going out on, in the field, the hikes, uh, and I mean, it's, it's to the point of, you know, you can tell like when, when a lot of got out of the, got out of the service, I mean, in the service, you could, you could you could be drinking all night and be eating tons of pizza and you'd still get up at four in the morning and you'd be out there running PT or running, um, you know, doing a, a 10 mile, five mile, 15 mile hike going on a field op, et cetera. And your your mind would be right in it. And it's because of the training that you're doing. Everything is in there and you're you're you know, you're constantly moving around and you're constantly in that mindset of and mode of moving and training. Um, whereas when you, when you get out, um, you're a civilian now and it flips. And now, you know, you, 
you have a pizza and you gain 10 pounds and you can't, you can't lose it because you're not in that mode anymore. And um, let us uh, then, okay, after training there and then you were deployed to Afghanistan, did you go to Helmand directly in Afghanistan? And how did you find the region? How was your experience there? So I went to, wait one second. Let me try to, how is my audio coming on your end? Very good. Is everything fine? Let me, let me, can I try to improve it if that's possible? Sure. Okay. okay. Is this audio better? This should be much better. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, so, so, so going to Helmand province, um, we left from Marine Corps Air Base Cherry Point. We flew to, um, Bangor, Maine. It was an airport in Maine. And then we flew to Shannon, Ireland. And then from Shannon, Ireland, we flew to, um, here we go. We, we flew to uh, Kyrgyzstan, actually, Bishkek. And we flew to, it was an Air Force base there. And then we went from there to um, Helmand Province to Camp DeWire, which is in the south. And then we left Camp DeWire and got on helicopters to this FAW, the forward operating base called Jaker. And from Jaker, we jumped on um, these vehicles called AMRAPs and MAPVs. And then we left from there to our patrol base. And I was at a patrol base called Lloyd Calais. My particular unit was uh, Charlie Company, the 1st Battalion, 9th Marines. And particularly, um, I was. I was in um, third platoon, and we and I stayed there for the remainder of the deployment. Um, so, what did I think of the environment of Helmand Province? Um, for for one, I mean, I think I very I think the most vivid thing I remember in, in those first couple days of deploying um, and traveling through the province, uh, we're traveling through the district of Nawa. Um, it was it was. The, the sort of historical aspect of seeing everything, of seeing these, these mud huts and seeing these village compounds and the blue burkas with the women and then the traditional shalwara kameez with the men and you see the turbans and, you, you know, the setting is just, it's, just, it's very striking to a 19 or 20 year old um, who's not used to seeing this stuff. And it's very, it takes you back for a second and you have to sort of, pinch yourself to wake up and say, wait, where am I again? You know, oh, this is Afghanistan. Because as much as you see the, the images and the pictures and videos of, you know, the news reports and all sorts of stuff, it's, th that imagery is very poignant, and, you know, sticks in your mind. Um, and that, that's, that's a culture shock for sure. And, you know, I can just, I can, I can think back on it now and I can remember like, you know, looking out of the windows of the AMRAP and just like, you know, we're, we're craning our necks and trying to see all these different villages to the left and right side of us. And at the same time, you also have, you know, you're, you're not there on the sort of um, uh, tourist expedition and you have to realize, oh crap, you know, we could be getting shot at, we could be getting blown up and everything, oh, you know, how do I remember my fives and 25s? And, you know, what, what is the training that I have to dig into? And, you know, you gotta pinch yourself and you gotta realize, well, I'm, you know, I'm in a combat zone all of a sudden. Okay, and uh, how long, uh, I mean, you spent there quite a long time, right? Yes, my first deployment, me and Shranz's first deployment was six months from uh, June, June to December of 2010. And then our second deployment was from September um, of 2013 until um, it was about May, May or April of 2014. Um, so about about a year, a cumulative year. So about six months and then six months. And am I correct to say that Helmand is quite a challenging place to be, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right. Well, you know, a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people, I mean, I, mean, I think it, it's, in terms of a counterinsurgency warfare, in terms of fighting the Taliban, um, in terms of 
you know, all these geopolitical aspects from the American side, from the Taliban side, from the Afghan side, from the local Afghan government to, you know, the various parties with the Taliban in there. Um, yeah, it's definitely a complex place. Um, it's definitely a very um, daunting uh, fight, so to speak. Um, but from, you know, but from what I saw, you know, from working with the police and working with the people and working with, you know, in the villages and stuff, you know, it, it, it's in, on the flip side, it's also not very a complex place. I mean, you see some of these villages and the, these are, you know, these are rural village lifestyles. These are, this is, these are the, the valley Pashtuns, um, you know, village life, vill, village life isn't that complex at all, right? I mean, you have the various traditions, you have Pashtun Wali, you have markets, that need to be made. You have farms that need to be done. You know, marriages happen, and then there's various festivals that go on. And you know, I mean, that's not complex. So, be, be, being in being an Afghan Pashtun or um, you know an Afghan um, um, living in Helmand Province, separate from the war, that village lifestyle is not complex. I don't think. Um, but then you add the war into it, and things become. Uh, become very, very bad, very bad to live in for a lot of different reasons on both sides.